So just to, just to and also there was a video recording of, uh, of the sessions. That's because, the, as I mentioned last time, this is part of the National Science Theory Consortium. And there are many other member institutions of the NSSC outside of the <coughs> Michigan State and the University of Nevada and elsewhere. So they each receive this and they're able to uh, stay abreast of what we're doing. Are they actually live on this? Yes. Sir. They can actually also <coughs> suggest and ask questions or make comments, criticisms. So uh, you're part of the larger operation. I'll just uh, say one other word again about the project. So in the beginning, there's usually kind of a slow start because you know you have a one-page summary of the issue here, the INF treaty. But it's plausible to say, well, what do I do? How do I fit in? What's my role and all that? So that's where Men Suk and Eric will guide you in the discussion session. But I would say it's not too early. To begin to just do a little homework on the internet about the INET treaty. Uh, it's all out there. I, I summarized it and it's on the piece of paper at the origins of the treaty and then uh, the decision by President Trump to uh, have the United States withdraw from the treaty. So you need to sort of get up to speed a little bit about this. So it's, it's not too early to begin. Any other questions, comments? Okay, so today I'm going to begin with some discussion just of the chronology of events, important events that began to lead up to the development of nuclear weapons. And uh, again, most of my, my sessions will be policy sessions. This is more just a chronological history. After I do this today and probably Wednesday, we'll turn to the first major meeting of the course on the policy side, which is Fred Kaplan's book, The Visit to Barmageddon. I don't know if you've gotten hold of it, but it's an excellent book. But it's basically about the Cold War, the US-Soviet nuclear competition, the Cold War. So these first two sessions for me are before that. What happened, what led to the Cold War? And then we'll go on into the other text, Brad Roberts' book, and so forth. And I'll speak uh, for about half the class. Please feel free to interject any thoughts, issues you have. And then I'll turn it over to Professor Van Bibber, who's going to begin to talk a little bit about the fundamentals of atomic physics. Again, the building blocks of the technical side of the issue. Coming attractions, I want to be clear what's coming. Okay, okay. so uh, and this chronology is on B courses. And just uh, uh, allow me to sort of plow through some of these major points and I'll make some comments as we go along. And remember, for those, those of you who weren't here last time, I began with a discussion about Hume's book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, and about how scientific progress is made. Uh, this is a, uh, these sequence of events sort of mirror what Hume said, which is that uh, there are initiatives taken, often independent of each other, um, and yet they begin to lead to a major rethinking of the general paradigm of the field that they're talking about. In this case, uh, the first uh, development of note was uh, some activities by a French physicist, Henri Becquerel. I, oh, and one other point, uh, since you're all 21st century people, um, and uh, Professor Van Bibber mentioned how important so many issues were in this field done at Berkeley, the very first point I'd make is that the origins of atomic physics were not done at Berkeley, were not done in the United States. They were done in Britain, France, and Germany, starting in the late 19th century and then into the first half of the 20th century prior to World War II. The United States was not a 
key player on this until later on in the late 30s and into the 40s with the development of the Manhattan Project in the New Deal. So Becquerel was from a very distinguished family in France. He was a third generation physicist. Uh, they have an organization in Paris that's equivalent to the Museum of Natural History in New York, world famous institution. And he was like the resident physicist for the Museum of Natural History. And he conducted his own experiments as part of that work. And uh, one bit of, uh, of experimental note was that he determined that the, that the element of uranium em emits radiation fluorescent property of uranium salts uh, emit radiation. But, and he did that by placing a piece of uranium salt on top of a photographic plate wrapped in black, black paper. The plate exposed uh, was exposed in the shape of the uranium sample. This was the very first inclination that uh, uranium was somehow different from other major elements. That there was something else going on here that we didn't understand. The next year, J.J. Thompson, a very uh, eminent British physicist, discovered negatively <coughs> charged electrons. And he used a, uh, an experiment called the Plum Pudding Model that neg negatively charged plums surrounded by positively charged pudding existed. But later it turned out that this Plum model was disproved by two other scientists, Hans Geiger and Ernest Marsden, uh, with the so-called gold foil experiment. I'm just going through these things quickly. You can look them up for further details. Then the beginning of the 20th century, you have a fundamental, uh, really fundamental break, and that's with the uh, theoretical work of Albert Einstein. And he published a series of amazing papers, Annus Mirabilis, Extraordinary Year Papers. And in his fifth paper, remember Einstein was a uh, patent clerk in Switzerland. If you didn't know about Einstein, it's a really an amazing story. He uh, was born in Germany. Um, he then, he couldn't get, he couldn't actually get admitted to any graduate program in uh, physics or related disciplines. He wasn't thought to be good enough. See, his hope was over there. Um, and he got a job as a patent clerk in Zurich, Switzerland, next door. But then on the side at night and on weekends, he began to read a lot about uh, and catch up with the field of physics at that time. And uh, he posed some amazing questions and developed the answers all by theory, just uh, pencil and paper, no experiments, no consultation with any other people to my knowledge. And one uh, paper he wrote was does the inertia of a body depend on its energy content? And he posed this relationship, M, which is mass, equals L divided by C squared, where L is the total energy of the body. And C squared is uh, twice the speed of light, which transformed M equals L over C squared uh, is the more famous Form E equals MC squared, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. Um, and this got these pop, all got published and were caused a huge stir in the physics community. He later did get appointed to major physics positions in Germany. Uh, and then when the Nazis came in in 1933, he fled to the United States. And he was based at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton and virtually his entire career. Um, so you see, people are looking at aspects of the problem, they're developing ideas, others are building on it, 
not necessarily in consultation. It's not a huge interactive team effort. Um, the next important development was Ernest Rutherford, also another very eminent British physicist who became, they established the Rutherford Laboratories after him. And he discovered the atomic nucleus. Although he was later asked 20 years after this, did he think that the, the concept of the atomic nucleus was at all relevant to atomic energy? And he said, no. So, you know, you can also be developing things without any real inclination what its application is. Um, in 1932, I think a lot has happened since this time. From 1911 to 1932, we had the First World War, 1914 to 1918. The U.S. got into the war very late in 1917 and uh, used uh, army forces to defeat the Germans and lead to a, a peace treaty, the Versailles Treaty. But then uh, in fact, uh, the head of the United States, President Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, the only PhD ever to be president, by the way, maybe there's another one in this room here, but uh, <laughs> Woodrow Wilson had called for uh, making the world safe for democracy um, because the First World War uh, led to the dismantlement of the Kaiser Empire in Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire in Austria-Hungary. Um, but uh, in all that time, uh, during the war and after the war, there were no major developments in this field. It's 20 years. So again, it's a very erratic, haphazard process. So if we were meeting here in 1932, I'd say, no one really had any idea that this earlier work by Becquerel, Thompson, Einstein, and Rutherford was going to lead to the development of a weapon which would revolutionize warfare. It would force some of disparate independent scientific activities. Then in 1932, Cockroft, who was, I believe, a student of, he was a student of a British physicist, possibly Rutherford, and Walton, they experimentally verified Einstein's equation by bombarding protons against a lithium nucleus which gave off energy and reduced the mass predicted by Einstein's equation. This was a hugely significant development. Because up until that time, you know, Einstein had written these theoretical papers and there was no evidence that he was right. It was mathematically correct, but it doesn't mean it worked in the real world. And Cockcroft and Walton proved it experimentally in 1932. The same year, Chadwick a student of Rutherford's, he discovered the neutron. So there you now have basically the French and the British and the Swiss German Einstein involved in the building blocks for nuclear, for atomic energy. In 1933, the French became engaged and contributed. Uh, Frederick Jolie Curie and Irene Curie, you've heard of Madame Curie, very eminent uh, French chemists, this properly discovered that aimed particles could change ordinary atoms from one element into another. And the same year, and this is very important, Leo Szilard, who became very central to the American nuclear weapon program, while still in England, conceived of the concept of a chain reaction. When every aspect of what's going on here was trailblazed, was new, there were no answers to the back of the book, there was no book. Um, And actually, Zillard was important because Zillard was the first scientist working in the field who 
who saw the military applications of this work. Nobody else did. In fact, there's an interesting anecdote. He was walking across the street in London. And I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, and it dawned on him, the light clicked, that there could be a chain reaction and this could lead to the release of enormous amounts of energy. Then we have a fourth country engaged, and that's Italy. And there, there was a famous uh, physicist, Enrico Fermi, who later became an eminent figure at the University of Chicago, key figure in the development of uh, some of the core ideas for nuclear weapons. Fermi demonstrated that nearly every element in the periodic table could be transformed by bombarding, bombarding them with neutrons including uranium, then the heaviest known element. Again, a totally unknown fact until he demonstrated it. Have any of you ever heard of a man named Richard Garwin? Garwin was a key figure in the US H-bomb program and has been active in many things for decades. Uh, I mentioned him because I, I, I don't know Garwin, but Garwin was a student at Fermi's at the University of Chicago uh, in the uh, late 40s, after the war ended. Then Garwin got involved in the thermonuclear weapon program. But uh, it's alleged, but I think it's correct, that Fermi once said of all his years in science, he only met one true genius, and that was Garwin. So when I met Garwin, and he's a pretty smart guy. Um, but he spent most of his formative years for me at the University of Chicago. Then we get closer to the start of the World War, the Second World War, 1938. And this is mentioned by uh, Professor Van Bibber. Two major developments, Otto Hahn, a radio chemist, and Lisa Meitner, a physicist both in Germany, he found a great number of radioactive products, all elements beyond uranium. At the, at this, up until then, uranium was considered the heaviest element. They found a whole bunch beyond uranium. And then Hahn and Fritz Strassmann demonstrated that the uranium atom could be split by bombarding it with a neutron. And that was the first demonstration of nuclear fission. So now we're starting to edge closer to the key ideas behind nuclear weapons. Uh, here, just a commentary about all this work <clears throat> done in France, done in Britain, uh, done in Italy, done in Germany. All the work was done in the open. There were no government labs at the time. It was all individual scholars working in laboratories. Uh, the work was done in Cambridge, in uh, Britain, in Paris, France, in Rome, Italy, and in Berlin. And they were all very small research groups. It's four independent activities. And there's all sort of groping for what is all this new stuff about. They're helping to create a totally new field that was completely unknown before their work which fits in the Kuhn model of uh, something's in a haphazard or, or not uh, well-developed manner, a combination of different initiatives lead to a fundamental rethinking of the field of knowledge. Okay, now finally, well, by 1938, a lot had happened in the real world. Hitler had been in power since 1933, Mussolini earlier still. The Japanese had a fascist government led by General Tojo. But they were all on the march. Um, Germany was on the brink 
of uh, uh, invading much of Western Europe. Italy invaded Abyssinia, which is Ethiopia and Africa. The Japanese invaded China. So you had very aggressive authoritarian regimes, <clears throat> although none of them had the knowledge of what we just talked about. It's probably just as well. Um, and then in 1939, 1939 is the year of the start of the Second World War. It's the year that that uh, Britain had warned Germany that if they invaded Poland, it would be war. Germany invaded Poland September 1st, 1939, and that's the that's the start official start of the Second World War. You know, it was, it was three years before the U.S. got involved. September 1st, 1939. Uh, they also invaded many other countries uh, in Scandinavia, in the Benelux countries, Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg. They invaded France in 1940. They bombarded Britain from the air. Uh, the Blitz, the famous Blitz in 1940. So now this work is going on, and some scientists are thinking, you guys, there could be an amazing application of this to a major new military weapon. And look who we're dealing with here in, uh, in Hitler, Mussolini, and Tojo. And this is now the first entrance of an American into this saga. Uh, Professor Inbibber mentioned, and I should mention that the Americans were following this research. They were becoming aware of it. Um, there had been a, a well-known experimental physicist at Berkeley for a number of years from the Midwest named Ernest Lawrence. And Lawrence was trying to build a world-class physics department. One of the individuals who he recruited was a theoretician, a mathematical physicist named J. Robert Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer had studied at Harvard and then he actually wanted to do research in uh, London, in England, but he was viewed as not sufficiently capable to do research. Uh, he wound up in Göttingen, Göttingen, Germany. Uh, and uh, after that, he was on the job market looking for an academic job in the US. And he thought that a lot of the East Coast schools were stacked with well-known people, and he would rather be in a newer place where he had a greater chance to make an impact. So Lawrence had contacted him, and Lawrence recruited Oppenheimer to the UC Berkeley Physics Department. Oppenheimer, as Professor Dan Bibber said, was a very eccentric individual hyper-smart, multilingual, completely disengaged in all things related to politics and international affairs and warfare, right until about 1936 or 37. I don't think he had ever voted. Uh, he was a theoretician, and it was said that the only thing he ever managed, the largest entity he ever managed was a 15-person graduate seminar which is nice, but uh, since he became the head of the Manhattan Project, it's a little, uh, you know, a little much. Um, in the meantime, Lawrence was proceeding with his experimental work, and he invented the cyclotron <coughs> right up the hill here. Uh, circular accelerating chamber between poles of an electromagnet particle accelerator for uranium isotope separation. And this led to the discovery of neptunium-238 that decayed to form plutonium-239. This was Lawrence's experimental work that led to the first realization that there was something else besides uranium that could be uh, fissionable, and that was plutonium-239. 
Anne Lawrence received the Nobel Prize for his development of the cycle chart. In 1940, war is raging in Europe. U.S. is still neutral. U.S. is not engaged in the war. U.S. has not been attacked. U.S. is maintaining its neutrality. Otto Frisch and Rudolf Perls, who are both uh, refugees from Germany, working in Britain, they noted the inside of Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr, the very famous Danish physicist. And Bohr had the insight that U-235 <coughs> was a thistle isotope of uranium. It wasn't any kind of uranium. It wasn't U-238, it wasn't U-239, it was U-235. And they anticipated that bombarding a U-235 nucleus with a neutron could release vast amounts of energy. And they uh, didn't publicize that. They wrote a secret memorandum to the British government. By 1940, Britain, Britain is being bombed by the Germans. Britain's at war. In 1940, there was also a special committee that had been formed in Britain, the MAUD, M-A-U-D, since the military application of uranium detonation. So now they're getting closer to understanding that uranium uh, can be separated and could be made to explode dramatically. And this was sufficiently significant that they formed a, a committee. This was after uh, Neville Chamberlain had been the Prime Minister of England and hoped to avoid war with Hitler. When that failed, Churchill became Prime Minister. And under Churchill, the MAUD was formed, the first scientific advisory committee of any government to look explicitly at the impact of military applications of uranium detonation. And this was secret, the MAUD was, was classified. So here now I just note in retrospect from 1933 to 1941, there were a variety of very famous scientists, uh, many of whom were Jewish, not all, but many of whom were Jewish. Hans Bethe, who later spent most of his career at Cornell. Ernst Bloch, Enrico Fermi, Frank Zillard, Teller, who was from Hungary, Edward Teller. Mickey <coughs> Weisskopf, who spent his years at MIT. Might have been the professor of all. I knew him Yeah, he was the chairman of us. Right. And Eugene Wigner, who was at Princeton. The, all of these were Jewish European scientists who led Nazi controlled Europe and contributed to the US atomic bomb program. So, this is a great irony. Uh, Hitler had been, of course, anti Jewish, a virulent anti Semite, ultimately created the whole process for the Holocaust. But in so doing, he shortchanged his ability to build a bomb. Because you have all these people, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and there were many others who could have been very important contributors to the German atomic bomb program, but they were not. They left the country. It didn't mean non-Jewish scientists couldn't build a bomb, but it would have been a lot easier if uh, they had remained in the country. Any questions on where we're going with this up to now? How many of you know all this history cold? This is all old, old hat to you. So a, a small number. Okay, so this is. Uh, then August 2nd, 1939, there was a famous letter, the Einstein Zillard letter to Franklin Roosevelt, U.S. President. Roosevelt was elected in 1932. He was president from 1933 to 1945 when he died. Uh, there was no atomic bomb development program in the United States at this time. Uh, only scientists were aware of this research in Europe. 
and that had no impact. There was no more than the United States. But Szilard, who, who was the one who visualized the chain reaction in England, joined uh, folks in the United States, and he said, Hitler, if he ever got the bomb, would be a mortal threat to the survival of all the countries, including the United States. It's an individual physicist. Zillard was from Hungary, I believe. So Zillard said, how can I call attention to senior government people about this amazing development? Who am I? I'm just a Hungarian refugee who's a physicist in uh, the US. And he said to him, and so just on his own, he said, the most famous scientist in this field is Einstein. If I can get Einstein to write something and we can find a way to get it to Roosevelt, that could start a process. So uh, it's actually an interesting story. Einstein was in in the summertime, he used to leave Princeton and he went out to Montauk Point at the tip of Long Island. And he was in a very obscure place. And also he was a bit of a hermit himself. So it took a lot a long time to find Einstein where he was. There's uh, lots of funny stories about how he thought he found Einstein, but he didn't. It was almost Keystone Cops kind of thing. But Zillard drafted a letter. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that Zillard directed the letter from Einstein to the U.S. president. <clears throat> Remember, Einstein, from his earlier days, had no knowledge, no appreciation of the military applications of E equals MC squared. He did not understand any of that. This is Einstein, pretty smart fellow. And Zillard convinced him of it, explained what was going on in Europe, explained the need to get it to Roosevelt's attention. They identified a key figure, Alexander Sachs, who was a financier on Wall Street with the Lehman Corporation, to urge the US to begin its own research on atomic bombs. So Zillard convinced Einstein to sign the letter that Zillard wrote in both their names. And Teller was involved in this as well. Teller visited Einstein with Zillard. That was always 1939. Then you have the start of the war. Um, and uh, again, it's all still while the US is neutral. October 1941, Roosevelt makes a decision. He's got a science advisor, Vannevar Bush, uh, and orders Bush to greatly intensify bomb research in October 1941. This is still before the US gets involved. The US doesn't enter the war until the Pearl Harbor attack, December 7th, 1941. And then right after that attack, US Congress declares war on Japan. And then a major mistake by Hitler, US only declared war on Japan because Japan attacked the United States. Hitler then declares war on the United States, which then permitted the US to declare war on Germany. Hitler's two greatest mistakes, maybe three, one was to stop the bombing of London which he could have continued and could have led to the destruction of the British ability to defend themselves. The invasion of the Soviet Union, which was in June 1941, and the declaration of war on the US. These were three fundamental errors of Hitler. Because then Hitler is fighting everybody. He's fighting the Soviets in the East, he's fighting the Americans and the British in the West. So that is all of the set of activities and highlights leading up to the start of the US atomic bomb program. And next time when we meet, I'll get you to 
Manhattan Project and the Bomb Program, and some some events in the aftermath of that program. Any other questions or issues? Is the chronology relatively clear? Yes, sir. Uh, he, he, he knew Roosevelt personally, and he was a conduit for the letter to get the letter to Roosevelt. I mean, you know, if you want to send a letter to the president, how are you going to do it? Not up your Einstein. Sorry? Yeah, but even Einstein, not obvious. I mean, you know, Roosevelt wasn't reading uh, Einstein's papers. Okay, all right, so I'm going to stop here and I'll turn it over to Professor Ed Bigger for some real material. Thank you. <coughs> Actually, there are very few upsides to being old. Um, I get discounted BART tickets, and uh, I, I get some money knocked off haircuts. Um, but um, the nice thing is that I actually, uh, the reason why this course excites me so much, and this excites me so much, is actually I knew of the eight people you mentioned, and one line there, I knew four of them, <laughs> and I knew Vannevar Bush. Uh, Vicky Weisskopf, as he was known affectionately, and uh, he shows up in, by the way, how many watched the movie Day After Trinity? You must watch it. It's yeah. a, absolutely, uh, it's a YouTube, perfectly free. It's a, just a wonderful, uh, uh, you just find it wonderfully uh, informative and, and, uh, and it's very, very well done documentary. He was the chairman of the department when I was an undergraduate at MIT. When I was an assistant professor at um, Stanford, <coughs> um, Felix Bloch, who had actually, uh, he, <coughs> Uh, and actually built up the physics uh, department there, starting in the 1940s, no Bill Lawrence himself. He was um, still there sitting in the front row of the colloquium. <clears throat> and um, the uh, very uh, acerbic uh, guy, but, but absolutely brilliant and wonderful to talk to, Swiss. Um, Hans Bethe from Cornell would come and visit him often, and very often I would have the privilege to actually shuttle a guy around campus in my old beat up boat. I was always afraid he was going to conk out and die. <laughs> and, uh, but he lives to be 99 years old, and he was still writing physics papers until shortly before he died. <clears throat> and um, Edward Teller, uh, after I left Stanford, I spent a quarter century at Livermore, and he was the founder of that lab. And um, he would call me in regularly to brief him. <clears throat> and it was a petrifying uh, uh, experience because uh, his secretary, he had been, of course, the director emeritus for many years, man of history. And he says, oh, Carl, Dr. Teller would like you to brief him tomorrow on such and such a topic. And I would be sweating bullets. I would not sleep a second that night. I would be preparing. <clears throat> and then I would go into the class, usually uh, into the, his uh, lunch uh, with him. That time he was already getting rather blind and, and deaf, um, surrounded by a, a monolayer of theorists, my friends. So it was my human shield of theorists, hopefully that he, he would actually direct his attention just to them and not to me. But he was a wonderful person uh, to know. And then Vannevar Bush, when I was a student, was still in evidence around MIT. Um, you know, he was the one that, that um, at the end of the war, wrote this. I think it was in the, was it in the New York Times? It was, um, uh, it was called Science, the Endless Frontier which basically cast the, the you know, the, uh, basically a, a, a new compact between government and society for large investment in science, federally funded science, it did not occur until, until that time. They saw what you could do in the Manhattan Project when you uh, <clears throat> put your mind to it and put in the necessary resources, how much could be accomplished in such a short time and how much, um, the, you know, the, our national security depended on scientific discoveries and, and technology. And um, it, that led to the foundation of the National Science Foundation. So it was just wonderful to know these people. They were they're really uh, very, very historic people. Other than that, 
no upside to being old. But uh, <coughs> anyway, on to a new day. Yeah, no, no, it's, it, only, it doesn't get any better from here, Michael. <laughs> okay, so let me just do a quick reprise of uh, what we were last time. And as I say, for the people here <clears throat> who are from uh, economics, um, political science, or undeclared whatever, don't worry. Uh, Eric is going to take special care of you, and there will be special, um, uh, there will be, um, uh, let's see if we can go right to this one here. Um, yeah, um, we'll ha actually have a <clears throat> special set of requirements for the exam uh, for you. Just a couple of things here um, for context. Um, we talked about energy. Um, this is old hat to you for all of you in the STEM field. Here I'm calculating in uh, MKS units. And I point out to you that <clears throat> a simple calculation you can do is if I lift your automobile, a one ton automobile, about 1,000 kilograms, 25 meters in the air, for example, driving to the top of the sixth floor parking garage, um, that's a quarter of a megajoule of energy. <clears throat> if I lift it um, up to 100 meters, uh, sort of a football field in the air, I, I, uh, that cost me about 100 megajoules of energy. Now, I'm, I think this is a fun number. Oh, we'll come back to that. I also mentioned that when you get into the world of atomic and nuclear physics, um, it's more convenient, not necessary, but it's much more convenient to use a different language. And the language we use is called electron volts where the basic uh, currency is, uh, of, of energy is how much energy does an electron pick up accelerating across a gap with a one volt potential, probably standard D cell battery. And uh, like that, <clears throat> 1.5 volts. Um, and that uh, is a, a one electron volt. If you go through one uh, volt the potential difference, the electron has picked up a kinetic energy of an electron. And then I mentioned the reason why we do this is, um, <clears throat> um, is um, simply one likes to work in a particular field where the numbers are not absurd. I hate numbers which are 10 to the minus 27, <coughs> numbers that are 10 to the 27. Much better to work in a discipline comfortably where the natural units go from maybe 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the 2. <clears throat> So when you're going from MKS units, uh, the, 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 the natural language for macroscopic uh, the world to uh, the subatomic world, it's 19 orders of magnitude. Multiplied by 10 to the 19th to go from EV to joules, 10 to the minus 19 to go from joules to EV, yeah. approximately. Uh, we also mentioned last time, and um, <clears throat> this is kind of a, a money slide, um, why this course exists. Um, you know, uh, and what gives, you know, you know, why, why these are, are such terrible weapons. Uh, and that is simply that um, uh, when one looks at the difference between the average brokering day-to-day uh, -day chemical reactions where you're trading in units of electron volts, when you go to uh, fission and fusion, here you take the simplest uh, fusion reaction, the one that people are really working towards making a commercial reactor, um, the, you have three million times more energy um, release than in a um, standard chemical reaction, for example, the burning of hydrogen and oxygen to form water. By the way, we have uh, three students from Professor Jean Lowe's group. You're, you're one. Are you from? Um, are you doing your experiments at NIF? Uh, I'm not. Okay. But we are visiting next. Yeah, he, he is a brilliant man. You're privileged to have him as an advisor. And, but he does many things. But in fact, part of his studies, and he made him as famous as he is, has been to use the National Ignition Facility to drive shocks or sometimes shockless compression to pressures that rocky cores of, of large giant planets, you know, to, to look at the equation of state of minerals at very high pressure. So he's a I sit on the uh, scientific advisory committee that allots time for NIF usage, and he's always a winner. He never loses, of course, and he shouldn't. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So we talked about uh, in the last thing about a megajoule. Um, we and NIF is this four billion dollar facility <clears throat> that takes you know, 192 beams, converts them into ultraviolet light, and puts about two megajoules of ultraviolet light into this little thing, a little, looked like a little fruit juice can with the holes punched in the bottom and the top, um, uh, called a hole ROM to make a bath of x-rays, which compresses the pellet. And we put in about two megajoules of energy. 
it sounds like a lot of energy. And after all, megajoule is, is what it takes to lift a car, a football field in the air. Um, <clears throat> so, um, and then you could say, well, how much is a megajoule of energy? And I've always liked this. <clears throat> Uh, and this is not to dis NIF or anything like that, but a megajoule of energy is uh, the caloric <laughs> output of a donut. Um, and I, I think the miracle here is to uh, uh, is, is actually uh, how much how efficiently the human body uses you know is able to convert vegetative matter and, and animal matter. Uh, into uh, the amount, huge amount of energy that a human being um, expends every day. We'll talk a little bit more about this in just a uh, future. Don't tell Congress that they spent $4 billion to buy a box of jelly donuts. Uh, and uh, by the way, they haven't gotten the 20 megajoules out quite yet, they're, but they're on their way. <clears throat> so um, here's another interesting factoid. <clears throat> and um, uh, in terms of energy density, how many joules you get out per gram or per cubic centimeter? Take a guess. Military grade high explosives like TNT versus a jelly donut. Interestingly, the donut has about two to three times more energy density than military grade high explosives. Military grade high explosives <laughs> gets you something else. What's that? Fast release, right. If you put a match to the donut, not much happens, okay. On the other hand, uh, high explosives are made to actually, what? You have yeah, a toasted donut, right, you know, boom. <laughs> uh, you, you, get, uh, you actually get a, a, a detonation wave. Now, this is something that's useless for the course, but I thought you just might find it fun. <laughs> I don't want to give you yet another system of units. So calories are going to be totally unimportant to this course. Um, the thing which is interesting is that what we call, uh, when you look at your, um, um, uh, at your um, uh, Quaker oats box in the morning, I eat oatmeal, uh, or you look at your donut package or something like that, you see calories. That's a bit of a fib. The calorie, a dietary calorie is actually a kilocalorie. It's a thousand calories. <clears throat> and um, a calorie technically defined, those who, who are our chemists here, material scientists, by one degree centigrade, yes. Yeah, so uh, one gram, which is one cubic centimeter, to raise that by one degree centigrade um, is the calorie. Just by luck, it turns out to be um, the, um, uh, it turns out to be the equivalent, a thousand calories turns out to be almost exactly the amount of energy released by TNT, which is a, an explosive that we uh, uh, concocted more than a century ago. Uh, I forget, five years, five years. Anyway, like that. Now, here's the interesting thing <clears throat> 220 calories, 221 calories per donut. What's a typical um, uh, human um, uh, requirement for the number of calories you need per day? Yeah. Right. Women typically 2,000, men typically black being large, on the baby 2,500. So roughly 10 donuts, but not a good idea, not a good idea. But 10 donuts would do, okay. And um, I always regret when I eat, even a single donut, I regret it. Uh, but, but 10 donuts gives you your, uh, your required caloric input per day, most of which you use for your metabolism, okay. Um, so, and, and that is, as we said, uh, so that would be like 10 donuts and each donut is, we said, what, a megajoule like that. So 10 megajoules of energy. Uh, so the amount of energy you expend as a human being um, is, would raise uh, a one ton automobile up um, a kilometer. Okay. So believe it or not, you say, well, I'm just sitting here like a lump on a, uh, a bump on a log, but in fact, your body, the metabolism, putting molecules back together, repairing all this kind of stuff, even if you're not doing a lot of exercise, is burning up a lot of energy. Okay. <clears throat> and bicycle racers in the Tour de France are burning up 10,000 calories a day, so, so to four to five times what we do just sitting in classrooms. Okay, so let's get on to um, the business at hand. Now, this should be old hat to you, but let me just take a quick quiz. I'll give you five seconds here. We'll take a hand vote. 
Suppose I take four separated nucleons, two neutrons, two protons, and I take them as combined into a helium nucleus, and I put them in a pan balance. How many people say, I'll give you until um, um, five seconds after the hour, uh, how many people say that uh, the separated protons and neutrons weigh more than the helium-4 nucleus? How many people say the opposite? Oh, good class. Oh, how many people didn't put their hand up? <laughs> okay, good. No, this is an important question. Okay, not, don't worry. You're going to be fine. Eric is going to take care of it. We're going to take care of you in this course. Okay, we'll come back to this in, in just a second. Um, so, E equals MC squared. Um, uh, one more thing here, and then I'm going to loop back. Um, this is, at the end of each lecture, I'm going to give you a cookbook. And the cookbook is going to be two or three conversions between one system of unit and another. One of the things you're going to be talking about here in uh, nuclear weapons, of course, uh, is um, they are uh, scaled or graded or um, uh, by kilotons. And that is the equivalent explosive energy of uh, a thousand tons of TNT. And uh, the first test that we did, in, and you see this in the movie Day After Trinity, that in Alamo Gordon, New Mexico, in July 1945, was um, 22 kilotons. It was the plutonium weapon. The uranium weapon was so was, was so evident, evident, self evidently going to work that the scientists uh, deemed it unnecessary to test. And in fact, they were correct. It was simply a gun design, we'll talk about later, to slam what looked like two large, you know, um, they looked like sort of like cheese rounds at one another over a distance of about three meters, you know, one of them on another like that to achieve the critical mass for uranium. That works for uranium-235 very nicely. You can do it fast enough to you'll get free ignition. And it was unnecessary to test. The one that they felt that they needed to test before usage um, was the plutonium device, which needed to be a spherical implosion for reasons we'll get into later on. And it worked exactly to spec. It surprised everybody, including Oppenheimer himself. And uh, the uh, yield was 22,000 tons. What are called, we'll talk about later on, two-stage boosted nuclear weapons get you into the hundreds of kilotons to megaton range, and this is when you're talking about <coughs> modern arsenals of the U.S. and the strategic arsenals of the U.S. and the Soviet Union. There, a kiloton, I want to calculate since I've given you, um, you know, you know what a, a gram of TNT is in MKS units, um, you can uh, uh, quickly derive that's 410 to the 12th. Four trillion joules of energy. Okay, so let's come back to the question in just a second we talked about before. Let me, um, so there's your toolkit number one. Actually, ignore bullets three through six um, and just focus on one, uh, one, two, and three. We even haven't talked about electric charge yet, so um, but we'll come back to that a little bit later. Okay, so things about. <clears throat> um, the, the essence of things that you see in just sort of an atomic or a, a modern physics course. Um, atoms, things are built of atoms. Uh, uh, fancy electron microscopes today can see things, can actually see the surface of a um, graphite sheet, they can see the surface of a mineral, and they can see, you can see individual atoms, and you have a little better resolution of an atom. That is about um, 10 to the minus 8 centimeter or 10 to the minus 10 meters, what we call an Armstrong. Uh, and um, what was learned by the experiments that, um, that Professor Knott mentioned, Rutherford and others uh, more than a century ago, um, um, was that uh, the, this was not a distributed jelly or kind of plum cake type of arrangement, but to everyone's surprise, the positive electric char uh, negative electric charges, which sum to zero, were uh, distributed in the following. The positive charges are all located in this tiny little kernel, this little nucleus um, and in, in the middle. And the electrons are whizzing around in open space around it in these, what, are, what we call orbitals, like that. A sense of scale. If the, an atomic nucleus were here and it were the size of a marble, 
the outermost electrons would be at McLaughlin Hall across the street or the, 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 the Dean's building there. So about 100 meters away. That might be a bit more than 100 meters. But that's a rough, rough scale like that. Inside the nucleus, you find that it's relatively close packed. It consists of a number of protons or neutrons, or a similar one charge, one uncharge, one level uh, particles, there, each of which has a size of about uh, 10 to the minus 15 meters or 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. We call, in honor of Fermi, a Fermi. <clears throat> so, typical atom, 10 to the minus 8 centimeter, typical nucleus, four orders of magnitude, four to five orders of magnitude, um, uh, small. Electrons, as far as we can tell, are point. How we okay. Um, don't pay a lot of attention to the details here. Um, uh, the the atoms, the distribution of atom of, of electrons in an atom, tend to be a little bit puffy and fluffy. In an atomic, atomic nuclei, tend to be relatively compact and with a uh, a, a fairly sharp edge to them. Uh, density distribution. Um, uh, key thing here is uh, we're actually going to be talking about any different types of, um, of, of um, atoms and isotopes uh, here. We normally write them uh, with their chemical symbol. There's aluminum, for example. Silicon, the next uh, heavier element up is Si. Um, helium is He and so forth. You know all this. In the upper left-hand corner is the atomic uh, I always get this right. The, uh, I'll, I'll get this wrong. The atomic, is it the atomic weight or the atomic mass? The integer. I forget. Anyway, 27, total number of nucleons. In the lower left hand corner, um, we uh, is the, the number of them which are protons. Normally that's not written because if it's if it's aluminum that has 13 protons, that's what makes aluminum aluminum. 13 protons, 13 electrons. If it's calcium, uh, then it's Z is 20. It doesn't need to be written, but you can write it there like that. But that's how we designate um, what uh, an atom is. Okay, now we're going to circle back to this question we asked before. So if I measure, if I if I uh, do uh, uh, spectroscopic measurements, if I weigh individual <coughs> nucleons. Um, and uh, uh, atomic nuclei. Um, I can measure them in uh, very accurately to many significant figures. The mass of a proton, uh, it's some terrible thing like 1.67, 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, but that's precisely why we don't do that. So that's we don't talk NKS when we talk atoms and nuclei. The convenient unit in language of electron volts is that a, a proton is 938.3 MV. Neutron is almost identically the same, just a tad high, a 1.2 MeV, 1.2 MeV higher. And um, an electron is about 1,800 times lighter, almost a factor of 2,000 times lighter than either a proton or a neutron, but it has minus one charge. Now, we make a definition here um, um, of what's, and this is, I'm going to mention this because I'm going to show you how to use a, an online table to learn about, um, uh, about um, you know, to look things up and to do problems and so forth. It's actually a, quite a nice thing for the National Nuclear Data Program. Um, what's called an AMU, an atomic mass unit, which is defined to be the mass of one twelfth, one twelfth the mass of a carbon atom. And it turns out to be ever so slightly lighter than um, the mass of the proton and the mass of the neutron. So one twelfth, there, there are six protons and six neutrons in, in a carbon-12 atom. If I divide the mass by 12, I get something which is 931.5, which, as you see, is about 8 MeV lighter um, than um, uh, the neutron. So in fact, I've just tipped you off and given you the answer. Something which is bound together is actually lighter than, um, than the separated constituents. Um, the degree is very interesting. You know, 8 MeV out of something which is almost 1,000 uh, MeV is uh, slightly less than 1%. Interesting thing to think about. Um, so uh, 
uh, in fact, it's, it's, it's uh, quite impressive here. Uh, let's see if I, my, my um, <clears throat> here we are. So there's the answer. The answer is that the left-hand side is the right, is correct. If I take the individual constituents, they weigh more than something which is bound together. And this really has to do with the fundamental uh, equivalence that Einstein points out um, of mass and energy. When you think about it, what happens if a, pro, a neutron and, deuteron and a, uh, a proton come together to form a deuterium nucleus? Where's our nuclear physicist? Here's a proton, here's a neutron, they come together and you get deuterium. They release energy. Yeah, in the form of a gamma ray. Yeah. So the fact that energy has left the picture means to say the energy, which is mass, of what's left behind is less. Okay. Energy is conserved, but the mass here has got to be less because in binding together, energy has been released. Same thing happens with chemical reactions. Um, if I burn things, if I oxidize things or make any chemical reaction, um, what typically comes off? Heat. Heat is energy. It leaves the scene, and therefore the stuff, be, if you put it on a pan balance afterwards, a uh, mass spectrometer, what is left behind must be lighter, okay, just by the conservation of energy. Okay. Now, when you think about it, to say that the individual parts here, you put them together to form an atomic nucleus, and on the average, it's a percent lighter. When you consider the, the energy equivalence of nuclear matter, all of a sudden you realize we're into scary business. That's a hell of a lot of energy. That's a lot of energy. And that's exactly where the, the whole promise of nuclear power and the whole terror of nuclear weapons uh, comes about. Okay, so, we define here, um, in, we'll talk about nuclear reactions. A plus B goes to C plus D. If I sum up the initial masses times C squared, and I subtract the sum of the final masses times C squared, I get what we call Q. In chemistry in high school, you would say something is exothermic if it releases energy. So in other words, if the, if the, if the reaction goes on its own, if it releases energy, it's exothermic. Q is a positive number. If you have to push to make the reaction happen, in other words, if it takes energy to make a, a reaction happen, then it's called an endothermic reaction, and that means Q is negative. We don't use the word exothermic, endothermic, and nuclear physics, but we say something has a positive Q value or a negative Q value. Okay. Your photo from a few years ago. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm back when I had hair. That's right. That's about it. It's retiring fast. <clears throat> okay, so um, just to alert you that when you go through various tables, you're going to see different conventions for mass. Um, all of them are based on the, uh, the AMU, the atomic mass unit, uh, but there's two very standard ones. In some cases, they actually write the mass of um, a uh, carbon 12 or oxygen-16 or helium-4 in terms of A and U itself. And you always see it's very close to the integer, but maybe a little bit above or a little bit below. <clears throat> um, the other we will talk about is um, um, in terms of what's called the mass. Um, where is it? It crossed this body somewhere. Um, <clears throat> the mass decrement here, or the mass excess here, which is the mass of a nucleus minus its atomic, um, uh, I get this wrong, atomic mass or atomic weight, the integer that, that describes what isotope it is. Um, you can think of it this way. <clears throat> if I wanted to make a table of the height of all the people in this room, there's two ways of doing it. <clears throat> you could say, you're 182 centimeters, you're 179 centimeters, you're 169 centimeters, whatever. So you could actually just put the absolute heights of people in centimeters. Or you could say that an average person is 175 centimeters, and all I need to do is tabulate the differences between that and a, an agreed upon arbitrary average, which we've agreed to be 
um, the average binding energy of, of carbon 12. So you could say, uh, instead of 182, we would call it your number seven, your plus four, your uh, minus six, and something like that. When you express masses in mass excess, all you're doing is saying that since by definition, carbon 12 comes out to be zero, <clears throat> we've used carbon 12, heaven knows why, I don't know who did it, but they chose, they anointed carbon 12 to be the one that has the average binding energy. And uh, therefore the uh, mass excess of carbon 12 is zero, 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 zero by definition. Everything else would be a little bit more or a little bit less than that. <clears throat> Um, when we look at this table in just a second, you'll see that the, the, the nuclear data tables uh, always work in mass excesses, and it, it's perfectly fine. Um, okay. Total binding energy is simply the sum of, the, of uh, hydrogen plus the sum of the neutrons minus the, uh, the mass of the species itself. Um, um, and if something is bound, then of course the binding energy is always going to be positive. Okay, I'm going to go back into detail. Um, I'll have you do a simple exercise. This is a, um, an experiment that was done in 1932 uh, by Chadwick, um, who um, uh, discovered the neutron. Um, and uh, they, uh, uh, he uh, <clears throat> did this reaction by which he took an alpha emitter, something emitted a um, the, 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 uh, helium-4 nucleus, which is an alpha particle, on a beryllium foil, um, it fuses, becomes carbon-12, which is exceptionally tightly bound, and it shoots out a, um, a uh, neutron of very high energy. And uh, I'll have you, you can work through that just to build a little confidence. It comes out to be 5.7 MeV. Um, interestingly, um, Chadwick's grandson um, uh, used to be a colleague of mine at Livermore. He's been at Los Alamos for many years, and he's a pretty high Muckety muck in the, uh, in the program down at Los Alamos. Extraordinarily good scientist. <clears throat> okay, this is important, um, maybe the most important slide you're going to see in the course. It's the thing that you really need to understand. Um, and you'll see it many times, so don't, don't panic here. This is the curve of binding energy <clears throat> as a function of mass. Here you've got the light stuff down here, which uh, most of us, you know, most of what we are is made of, um, you know, water, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, that kind of stuff, um, um, and so forth. And then you, you get to the very heavy elements, and when we get up to uh, talking about nuclear fission, we're going to be talking about the actinides, which are up here in the 200s or so. So this is the binding energy per nucleon. So if I take the binding energy, the, the sum of the individual protons and neutrons, <clears throat> minus the mass um, uh, of the thing that, uh, of the nucleus itself. Um, by definition, because the nucleus itself is bound, the binding energy is always going to be written as a positive number. And I divide by the number of nucleons. It turns out on the average across the periodic table, this is a number that tends to be about seven and a half or eight MeV. Once again, that you know means to say that 8 MeV out of an individual nucleon, uh, which is close to 1,000 MeV, it's a little bit less than a 1% of its mass basically is given up to energy that was somehow radiated away <clears throat> or pushed away in the reaction that formed, formed this thing. It's a very interesting curve to look at for a few reasons. Um, most interestingly, you see, it's an interesting reaction, uh, interesting plot to look at because for most of the atomic um, chart of the nucleides, it's flattish, except it kind of tails off down here. In fact, it's not quite flat. Once you get to the peak around iron, the binding energy becomes very slightly less as you go up in mass. Uh, at iron, you're about eight and a quarter um, uh, MeV per nucleon. By the time you get to uranium, you're at about seven. So you've lost about uh, an MeV of binding energy per nucleon um, in going from uh, light middleweight nu nuclei up to the actinides around 200 or so. 
On the other hand, you have this steeply rising curve. Um, um, things which are very light are not terribly well bound, and uh, they can be much more bound um, if, if they group together, if they fuse together and form uh, uh, heavier nuclei. Er early star uh, formation of, you know, uh, um, you know, stellar burning that goes on in the life cycle of stars burns hydrogen into helium, helium into oxygen and nitrogen, uh, oxygen and carbon uh, into silicon all the way up to iron, and then uh, things generally stop, except that they don't. Anyway, so here's, I'm blowing up part of this graph to make an important point. Um, and, and again, this is, you know, I think, you know, familiar to you if you uh, have done 101. If not, this is, I think, a fairly simple point to grasp. Um, things which are have a higher binding energy are more stable. And it means to say, if I take two things which are less tightly bound and I put them together and form something which is more likely bound, in fact, I'd get energy out. So there's actually two paths to make money here. You can actually release energy, a lot of it, um, by fusing things together <clears throat> from light nuclei to things up towards the iron region. It turns out it's not too practical. There's really only a few reactions down here which <coughs> pay off. Or I can take um, very heavy nuclei and I can split them in half. Let's do a simple example. If I have, uh, let's take, uh, let's just say, uh, uh, take your uh, plutonium 239 plus a neutron at mass 240. Average binding energy is about seven and a half um, MeV. Suppose I divide that into two fragments. They tend not to split very symmetrically, but suppose I divide 240 into two halves of 120 each. What's the average binding energy per nucleon of um, the things they've split into? Eight and, a half. Eight and a half. On average, I have made one MeV um, per nucleon here. So I've actually got more than 200 MeV of energy release by splitting that nucleus in half. So there is energy locked in the uranium nucleus that is released by breaking in half. There's energy locked in very light nuclei by allowing them to come together. The Fission weapons are the ones, and fission reactors are the ones which uh, release energy by taking uranium and having it fission into two fragments and going up to more tightly bound nuclei. Fusion, the, the, the dream energy, you know, the energy of the future, as they say, always was, always will be. Uh, tritium plus deuterium makes helium four plus a neutron, releases a heck of a lot of energy. You know, 18 MeV, um, uh, no, you said more than that. Yeah, 18 MeV. Um, uh, and, um, it, you know, so you're releasing 18 MeV with five nucleons. So it's releasing three mega electron volts of energy per nucleon involved in the process. This is um, uh, where much of the energy of what's called the second stage of a, of a nuclear weapon, the thermonuclear stage, comes from which is the fusion of deuterium and tritium. Nuclear weapons are a little more complicated than that, but we'll talk about that later. Okay, um, I'm, I'm seeing people peer in the in the. Can you also mention the Fee's book, The Curve of Binding Energy? The wonderful book. From yes. The uh, was it the Fee or was it Ted Taylor? Was the Fee? John Fee. Okay. It was a history of uh, his, about uh, about the. Um, uh, about the, the weapons program right. at Los Alamos, was right. that? Yeah. And the importance of that group. Right. Now, don't panic. We're going to do this. We're going to, like penicillin, we're going to give several doses here. Uh, and uh, so we're going to come back to this. I see people peering in the window. Next time, we're going to come back and I'm going to show you how to navigate around the chart of the nuclei, look up mass excesses, and begin to do problems that you can do with a four function calculator. So if you open up a bank account between now and uh, Wednesday, they'll give you a free calculator and uh, the size of a credit card, and then you can calculate two values. Good. My voice lasted.
So do you not consider um, Hitler's expansion into Africa not to be a mistake? Do you consider that a... Well, I want to add that as a spoiler mistake.